Hi guys, I'm here today to talk about the first good novel that I read in 2021 and to tell you what it is about and what I thought was beautiful about it and why it might be worth reading for you but also to point out what was not so beautiful about it and what could have been done better in my opinion. The book is The Bedlam Stacks by Natasha Pulley. This is a historical novel, or rather para-historical novel, set for the most part in the year 1860. The protagonist and first-person narrator is Merrick Tremaine. He is, or he used to work as an opium smuggler for the East India Company, but he was wounded between one of his trips between India and China. He sustained a leg injury and thinks he has now been retired. But in fact, the East India Company, or as it is then called, the India Office, still have use for him. They are sending him to Peru to get cuttings from the cinchona tree, from which you get quinine, which is used in the treatment of malaria. Malaria was at the time affecting the poppy plantations in India quite badly. They are sending him not just because he is a skilled horticulturist, but also because his family, his father and his grandfather, who are both deceased, have or had ties to the region where the last wild cinchona trees are growing. Unfortunately, the state of Peru has declared a monopoly on the growing of cinchona trees and the production of quinine, so they will have to get the cuttings in secret. Together with Merrick is sent a geographer slash cartographer friend of his, and he is going to make a map of the region should the British at some point in the future need to go and get in and get more trees or even send the army in to do so. So the book is a very slow going adventure story about Merrick's and Clemens's journey there and about if and how they are going to get the trees and how they are going to get out alive and about who and what factions are going to stand in their way. They have one very strong and capable ally in the priest of the town New Bedlam, which is the town nearest to the Cinchona trees where they are going. And he is appointed to them as a guide by their contact in a town near Lake Titicaca. And the contact claims to own the land on which New Bedlam lies. And therefore the priest who is called Raphael, but who is in fact indigenous or Indian, as they called it then. He answers to this landowner of Spanish descent in a way. So he is, is appointed to be Merrick's and Clemens's guide, but also minder, and he is supposed to keep an eye on them and to see um, what they get up to in the forest. But from the beginning, he is also kind of their ally because it's not really clear where his allegiances lie and where he will stand should it come to a confrontation and should Merrick and Clemens have to fight their way out. I mentioned at the beginning that this is rather a para-historical than a historical novel and it is the setting that makes it para-historical because the setting is a kind of a steampunk version of Peru or a South American forest. It is a magical, almost mythical landscape at first glance. The wildest, most fantastical phenomena seem to occur there. However, it is only at first glance and only if you glance at it from a with a Western eye that isn't used to these things that it seems fantastical, but all these phenomena actually have rational and scientific explanations or pseudo-scientific explanations because we are talking about things here like the air is saturated with pollen who glow when they are disturbed, kind of like bioluminescent algae, 
with the difference that they can also burn if they are disturbed too drastically. They are also used in lanterns and they are people's primary source of light rather than candles. And there is also a kind of wood that is so low in density that objects that are made of it hover above ground. And that is of course of use in all kinds of everyday tools and activities. So these are things that seem fantastical to us, but since they all have a rational explanation and are used by people in very prosaic ways, it never feels like an exoticization of the Peruvian setting or of the people who are in it. And in fact, that is one of the main points that the novel makes. Throughout, it goes against the othering of people and of ways of life that we are unfamiliar with. And one way it does that is that it shows that there is an explanation for everything that is more likely than not just as rational or at least just as valid as any explanation that we have for our own ways of life, our own conventions and the phenomena that take place in our own environment. And another means by which the book does it is by showing and contrasting two different approaches to language and translation. Because of course, language of whatever kind is always the means by which we make contact with other people. The two different approaches are represented in the two British men, our protagonist Merrick and his geographer friend Clemens, Clemens Markham, who was a real person, by the way. And he likes to think of himself as a brilliant and sophisticated scholar, but he has a scholarly mindset only in so far as he likes to learn everything that the textbooks tell him and then takes pride in his superior amount of knowledge or what he thinks of as knowledge. But he is not really inquisitive in a genuinely curious way. He already knows everything and he is very set in his conventional ways of thinking and of approaching new things, new people, new phenomena. He has already made up his mind about everyone and everything that he encounters in Peru beforehand. And it makes him see the people, especially the indigenous population, in a very superiorly wide way. And he is very condescending towards them. And he doesn't really engage with them because why would he? He already knows everything anyway. And these people are at best noble savages as long as they do what he wants and when they don't they are just idiots. So he is unable or unwilling to truly listen and to examine the bias that he brings to everything and therefore he remains comfortably within his superiority complex. Merrick is the opposite due to his character but also to early exposure to Quechua and to tales from Bedlam and the surrounding area that he heard from his father and grandfather. Due to that he is open to the idea that the Peruvians might be actual people and that they are just as evolved and capable of rational thought as the English. So when his guide Raphael says something that seems contradictory to him or when his companion Clemens who has some Quechua, when he complains that Raphael's translation makes no sense or even that he has translated something the wrong way into Spanish or English, in these cases, Merrick tries to get to the bottom of what caused the misunderstanding or why Clement's translation didn't work or what caused Raphael's translation to seem contradictory or nonsensical. So he tries to translate between translations, so to speak. He realizes that translation isn't just about finding an equal number of seemingly equivalent words in the two languages and he realizes that we can do people an injustice 
by translating them too literally. There is a lovely quote from Merrick about how he approaches translation. He says, I had to forget the English, hang the meaning up in a well-lit gallery, stare at it hard, then describe it afresh. And this is about more than idiomatic expressions and turns of phrases. But in order to truly represent the meaning of words in one language, in a different language, we have to translate between the cultural contexts as well. And something that has value in one cultural context is best described in a different language, in words and terms that have value and validity in that other cultural context. There is an express example in here when the priest, Raphael, complains about how ineffective the indigenous protests were when the Cathedral of Lima was built. Or not built exactly, but cut from the living rock, which was exactly the problem. I'll read you the passage. This won't make complete sense. It's very far into the book and you need a bit of background knowledge to fully understand what this is about, but you will get the gist. So Raphael says, I don't like bad translation. I don't like idiots who go around telling white men that the mountain's alive and it thinks things and that villages are watched over by special people who turn to stone. But that's what it is, says Merrick. No, it isn't. That's terrible. That's not how you'd say it in Spain or England, is it? You'd say, there is a particular hereditary illness in the Indian highlands that causes petrification and eventually renders the sufferers inert in a kind of permanent catalepsy and apparently part of the surrounding rock, which has led to a cultural tendency to be very careful of stone and a religion that reveres it. That's exactly the same thing in the language that you actually speak, rather than in Quechua but using Spanish words. So the protesters weren't speaking the conqueror's language on a deeper level. The words that they used weren't effective means to make their reasons seem valid in the conqueror's ears. So in the end, it wasn't a good translation. Merrick understands that and therefore he is able to connect with Raphael and a very beautiful relationship develops between the two. And the book is just full of these beautiful scenes and, and phrases that express these ideas. And because Merrick has such a comparatively unconventional mind and he thinks in new and fresh and unconventional ways. There are so many beautiful turns of phrases in this book. I have tapped so many pages and I could have tapped so many more. There was one thing about the book though that surprised me and disappointed me really. While the book continuously denounces these colonial condescending attitudes in the Peruvian context, it just as continuously lets the British Empire off the hook. Merrick used to smuggle dirty bloody opium into China for the East India Company and now they are sending him to steal medicinal plants from the state of Peru, which they need because malaria is killing their workforce in the, the native Indians in the Indian poppy plantations by the thousands. And all these people are only there because the British opium industry ruined the agricultural landscape in the affected regions in India and forced workers into the plantations in the first place. And nowhere in the book is it expressly acknowledged that maybe that is not so good either. Of course, with a first-person narrator, this can be a bit tricky and you need to be a little inventive. But just one signal is usually enough. And 
Of course, you can't do everything in one small novel, but then don't bring it up. Don't make your protagonist and hero an ex-smuggler who takes pride in his work history and who even thinks back on his days in India with nostalgia. So that left a bit of a bad taste in my mouth. And it also surprised me because the book is otherwise so sensitive and attuned to these issues. And it's such a bloody shame because there is so much beauty in this book. And it could have been perfect if Natasha Pulley had just been willing to risk alienating a reader or two and bring this point across as well. But with the exception of that, I thoroughly enjoyed reading this book and I loved the themes of language and translation and I so enjoyed all these beautiful turns of phrases that the narrator comes up with. And obviously I'm, going, I'm not going to tell you the ending, but the ending is just so bittersweet and I laughed, laughed, laughed it and just it, it left me with a mushy feeling, the ending, but the book as a whole, if it weren't for the whole opium and East India disappointment. But with the exception of that, you know, <laughs> this is the kind of book that I would like to write. And if you have read this book or if you are going to pick it up after you've watched this review video, then I'd love to connect and talk about the book with you. So that is, I think, all that I've wanted to say today about this book. I might talk more about it in the future, maybe share some more of those beautiful quotes that I tapped. But for now, that's it. Happy reading, guys. Bye.